Hello and welcome to episode three of Starting to Live in God's Divine Will with Father Dr. Iannuzzi, expert in eschatology and prophetic literature. Father, could you please start us with a prayer? Yes, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us turn to our Lord and invoke the reign of his kingdom on earth as in heaven by together praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, Father, if you turn on the internet, or search the internet, or social media, we will find thousands of people who claim to be visionaries, prophets, or seers. And this is unsettling that a whole subculture of Catholics are following celebrity end time seers that are using this direct to internet social media platform where daily messages from heaven are being marketed in such a fashion that an end time soap opera is being perpetuated. So our question for you, Father, is, with so many seers who have gained celebrity and throughout social media and the internet, how does one discern false prophecy from authentic prophecy? Very good and timely question because in these end times, there's no shortage of individuals claiming without any ecclesial weight, clout, authority to be spokespersons of God through these messages they claim to receive. Now, on the one hand, the church does not require that in order for a person to believe in an alleged revelation from an alleged seer, that it have the church's seals of approval. On the other hand, and in the same breath, the church acknowledges that there are many out there that are false. So how do we muddy through these murky waters and discern that which is of supernatural origin from that which is not of supernatural origin. So as to avoid deception, the devil's pitfalls, whether these people that claim to receive messages are sincere or insincere is less important than the content of the messages they claim to receive. So let's focus on the objective facts and overlook the subjective intent of the person claiming to receive the message. Because they could be in good faith, but be in good faith deceived. Now, it is a good thing to inform one's self of God's word, whether it's in scripture, catechetical teachings, magisterial teachings, which are contained in the catechism tradition, as well as post-biblical prophetic messages, provided they are consistent with the previous three sources of our faith, namely scripture, tradition, and magisterial teaching. Because most people are not conversant in theology, they don't have the time nor the tools to know whether or not these messages are consistent with these three sources of our faith or not, these three founts of our faith or not. So on the one hand, it's a good thing to inform one's mind of God's word. But uh, having said that, I wish to extend a word of caution here to everybody. Chasing after the latest alleged unapproved revelation of God is dangerous. The very approach of doing that is dangerous. We should not chase after any messages. What we should rather do, and I'll explain why this is dangerous in a moment, is meditate, assimilate, masticate, first and foremost, those, those truths in the gospel. Unless we've done that, there's no sense in running after prophetic end time revelations because these will not engender within us stability in the Christian virtues that leads to spiritual growth, heights of perfection, intimacy with the Trinity. Rather, these are more or less incentives to go to the gospel. They're not ends in themselves, they're a means to an end, okay? So we should really first and foremost be familiar with the gospel, okay? 
because that is the standard by which all future post-biblical revelations are to be measured. No revelation that comes after the gospel can never supersede the gospel as the normative source of our faith. It will always be that standard bearer of revelation. So if people are not familiar with the gospel, they will be deceived when they read these anti-messages because they won't know how to compare them with the unchanging doctrine of Christ and the apostles. Now, why is this a dangerous approach to chase after these messages that are not approved by the church? First and foremost, it's because most who claim to receive messages out there are inauthentic. Whether they're in good or bad faith, that doesn't matter. The messages are not authentic because they contradict scripture or tradition or magisterial teaching or all three. And I speak as someone who has acquired the title to teach theology in specifically the fields of dogmatic and mystical or spiritual theology. Now I acquired this title by presenting my doctoral dissertation before the faculty of professors from the Pontifical University of Rome authorized by the Holy See. And that university gave its seal of approval to my dissertation and the title doctor. I don't say this to any merit of mine own, not to blow my trumpet, but to assure the listeners that what I share with you is not my personal opinion. It's the fruit of my years of research in these fields. I've even been formally commissioned by the church to review the writings of mystics in their cause of beatification. And I'm still doing that in different dioceses, okay? So you're, I'm speaking simply as someone that has experience and I wish to share that experience with you without interjecting anything personal from me. <laughs> That's what I don't want to do because that opinion of mine is no more important than your opinion, okay? So I'm not interjecting any opinions here. There are seers that are putting out messages on the end times and these go on unchecked for years without the church ever giving its approval. Now, there have been cases I am familiar with where after years of going unchecked, these messages were finally condemned. This has happened more often than not. Those that were approved are far less than those that were condemned. These are facts, I'm not, not my opinion. And that's reason to be cautious, number one. Number two, another reason for this dangerous approach of chasing, chasing after these unapproved revelations is in the fact that many of these revelations are received by alleged seers who do not have proper theological or spiritual guidance. They don't have a spiritual director. They don't have a, a confessor, a wise confessor. So they kind of go off on their own and start sharing them with other people. Now, John of the Cross cautions us to this approach of running after the latest and greatest message. And if you want, Dr. Michael, I can share with you these passages of St. John of the Cross. Please do. All right, in his work, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, in chapters 29, 30, and 31, he talks about three different types of revelations from God mm -hmm. to anyone, including you and me, as well as prophets. But they are compartmentalized in two groups of mystical gifts. One is ordinary, the other one is extraordinary. Two forms of inner voices that come from God, John of the Cross labels as ordinary gifts, and they are known as, respectively, formal and successive locutions. Now, when locution is an inner voice, it doesn't necessarily come by way of words, but by way of a light of knowledge, like an infusion of an idea, an image, a, an event, mm -hmm. a prophecy. And the third type of locution, which belongs to the extraordinary gifts, is substantial locution. Now, I wish to emphasize these three distinctions, this tripartition of locution, not only found in John of the Cross's works, who's a mystical doctor of the church, but also in the Vatican Dictionary that came out about seven years ago. And I have it. It's in Italian, not yet translated into English, but they compartmentalize these three types of inner messages from God, from Mary, etc. The first type that John of the Cross talks about is successive locution. Here he says that, Anyone can receive these locutions if they are in a state of recollection, in a state of prayer, meditative, contemplative union with God, with their senses recollected and centered in God. In these moments, the soul can perceive that which God reveals to it. But John adds that when the soul expresses that which it receives, 
that expression is not of God. It is of the soul's own faculties. Because if God reveals to you a light of knowledge through an infused revelation, you have to break down the words or put them into words in your own language. God doesn't always speak in the language in which we speak. He, he just gives us this infused knowledge many times. So when we are forming the statements or the words, these are not from God. John of the Cross states this. And this again comes from chapter 29, article one, from his work, The Ascent of Mount Carmel. And he states as follows. It is noteworthy that this successive locution always occurs when the spirit is recollected. There is actually no deception of the intellect. See, that's the light of knowledge from God that anyone can receive. There is no deception of the intellect, yet there can be and frequently is deception in the formal words and statements. The intellect deduces from it, see? So there's the danger. The second type of locution John addresses is known as formal locutions. And here he says that in this revelation that can come to anyone, it's an ordinary gift. So the ordinary person can receive it like the success of locution. The soul does not have to be recollected to receive this, this uh, formal locution. He writes from chapter 30, articles one through five in his ascent of Mount Carmel. This formal locution is produced in the spirit without the use of the senses. It comes independently of whether the spirit is recollected or not. And then he goes on to explain how unlike the previous successive locutions that are caused by the recollected spirit and the words are formed by the human intellect, not by God, and the statements as well are formed by the human intellect, not by God, which can be deceived. And he says frequently so. These formal locutions often occur without any recollection and they are often like ideas spoken to the spirit. Ideas, not words. As though one person is communicating with the other, but without the use of words. And then this is what he adds. This is the important part I wish to emphasize. And why I say chasing after these unapproved revelations is dangerous. He states a person should pay no more attention to these formal or successive locutions than to other kinds. For besides occupying the spirit with matters irrelevant to faith, they will make one an easy victim for the devil's deceits. At times, one can hardly discern the locutions, formal or successive, spoken by the good spirit or those coming from the bad spirit. Nevertheless, these locutions should be manifested to a mature confessor or to a discreet wise person who will give instructions and counsels and consider the appropriate thing to do. This is where many of these alleged rebel seers asserting they receive revelations today fail. They don't seek counsel from a wise confessor, from a spiritual guide, a theologian, so as to avoid confusing the, the inspiration from the bad spirit from the inspiration from the good spirit. The third type of locution John addresses is found in chapter 31. Article one in the ascent of Mount Carmel, known as substantial locutions. And these are extraordinary. Very, very, very few people receive them. You can count on one hand the people in the world that receive these that are um, in, let's say, line with the teachings of the church, the magisterium, and the, and the have the approval and the backing of the church. You people in our lifetime, we know like if you were born like me in the 60s, you know, certain saints that have since died that have had these gifts. Mm -hmm. Today, you have people like this as well out there. Now, um, people, some of them are approved by the church, like the writings of Father Stefano Gobi, St. Faustina Kowalska, St. Padre Pio, that came before us some during our lifetime, and others. Now, these substantial locutions, John of the Cross reveals, are extraordinary. They are impressed very formally into the soul and are different in their effect from the successive informal locutions in that their effect is vital and substantial. For example, if our Lord should say formally to the soul, be good, it will immediately be substantially good. If he should say, love me, it would without delay and at once have and experience within itself the substance of the love of God. And if he should say to a soul in much fear, do not fear, it would without delay feel great fortitude and tranquility. 
A locution of this sort does more good for a person than a lifetime of good deeds. Okay, so those are the three locutions John of the Cross speaks about, but I, what, what I wish to emphasize in the context of your question mm-hmm. is that it does you more harm than good to chase after these. So John tells us what we should do when we have these types of locutions. He says that we should focus on the love of God when we receive them and not on sharing them with others, mm. not on trying to formulate what they mean with our own words, because that's where the errors happen. He says, focus on the love of God, and then these, the meaning of these locutions, successive, formal, rarely substantial, begin to reveal themselves. Then we present what we receive in prayer to a mature confessor, spiritual guide, or that which we receive in locution. So it's a, it's a very delicate distinction between the messages from God, from the human psyche, and from the devil. Oftentimes they are indistinguishable. So to check my understanding, Father, so the writings of St. John of the Cross, they provide an understanding of how this misunderstanding, this misinterpretation of locutions can occur. Like the soul may have a real mystical experience, a real success of locution, where they misinterpreted as an extraordinary, substantial locution. And that sort of sincere misunderstanding can easily occur to well-meaning people without proper theological direction. Absolutely. And that's why I don't say that they're bad people. Many of these people are churchgoers. The majority go to church. They're fear, they're God-fearing people. And they're in good faith, but they're misguided to their own unawares. And if they don't go to a mature, wise confessor or a priest or a spiritual guide that is conversant in this matter, they will be most likely encouraged to follow the voice. But it's oftentimes mixed with their own knowledge of catechism, with their own knowledge of scripture, and their own human voice. John of the Cross is some people like this, unless they consult with a guide in this field, will think that God is speaking to them, but in fact, they are listening to their own voice. Mm. These are the words of John of the Cross. You remember the apocryphal books, right? That oftentimes are published as an addendum in some versions of the scripture. Now the apocryphal literature is not inspired by God. I use this as an analogy. I think it's a very good analogy because in apocryphal literature, there is both good and false. So, for example, we find the names of Joachim and Anne not in scripture, but in apocryphal literature. And the church, even prophetic writings approved by the church, show that these truly were the parents of Mary. Even the servant of God, Louisa, speaks of Joachim and Anne as the parents. But their names are mentioned in apocryphal literature. So apocryphal literature, like the Gospel of uh, Enoch and uh, Mary Magdalene and Thomas, Mm -hmm. these contain falsehoods mixed with truths. That's why the church will never admit them to the canon of scripture, never, because scripture contains no falsities. Those people who receive these messages are sort of like giving you apocryphal messages. They're giving you something that's true. So they'll talk about preparing for the end times. That's true. They'll talk about um, persecution of the church. That's true. But then they'll throw in something that's not of God of their own human reflection. Like the Pope is bad, don't follow the Pope, he's not validly elected, or that uh, the hierarchy is full of Freemasons and the church is going to hell in a handbasket. And you say, wait a minute now, didn't Jesus Christ say in Matthew 16, hell will not prevail against this church founded upon the papacy? So how can this message give me this with something true and see where the confusion comes in? It's just like giving you apocryphal literature. And I've heard expressions like the consensus of the mystics, the consensus of the prophets, the consensus, all unapproved, by the way, most of them, if not all unapproved. You cannot go by that standard. You will be deceived because there is no consensus among the mystics. There isn't. There's no consensus. There's rather a consensus of magisterial teaching. There's a consensus of apostolic succession in teaching and power. There is a consensus of teaching founded in scripture, magisterial teachings, and tradition. There's no consensus among the prophets or the mystics. You can use that as a standard by which to gauge the authenticity or lack thereof of a given alleged revelation. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You have to rather not use a consensus of mystics, but rather scripture, magisterial teaching, tradition. This is the bulwark of our faith. So the St. John of the Cross writings, do they also offer a direction for the many people who experience a successive locution? And, and many of us in Catholic spiritual circles, we've noticed that many people talk about these locutions and they want to express them, they want to analyze it. Yes. So would these books guide us to not obsess about these yes. mystical experiences and move along with your spiritual mm -hmm. life? and not yes. bring it to the public? Yeah, I would recommend, John of the Cross wrote only four works. The Living Flame of Love, um, Spiritual Canticle, The Dark Night of the Soul, and The Ascent of Mount Carmel. And The Ascent of Mount Carmel is the one I would recommend when it comes to discerning true from false locutions, from God, the human psyche, or the devil, discerning the three sources. In particular, chapters 29 through 31, I wish to share with you one particular passage in relation to what you just shared now in terms of asking for some guidance. This is what John shares from chapter 29, article 1, when he talks about successive locutions, the first type of locution. He states, the desire for such locutions, the key word is desire, the desire for such locutions and attachment to them will cause these persons to answer to themselves and think that God is responding. The benefit to be gained from such successive locutions will not come from focusing one's attention on it. The benefit will be received by refusing to focus on the intellect on what is communicated and centering the will on God in love. So if there is any approach in which to discern or re respond to these locutions, it's don't focus the intellect on them. It's counterintuitive, mm. but this is the way in which to avoid deception. We focus the will on the love of God that emerges from his divine will. That keeps us from deception. But even with that, we still, when we believe this is of God, should manifest it to a mature confessor. And he will look, counsel us on the appropriate thing to do. Even John of the Cross had his counselors. He didn't just say, oh, I'm a doctor of the church. I don't need to counsel with anybody. You know, even the greats had to go. St. Teresa of Avila had to go to a confessor. Mm -hmm. Even she was a mystic. This is how God works. Even Louisa Picaretta. Here she is talking directly to God more than any priest. And yet God says, go to the priest. Do what he tells you. Another uh, point is by St. Hannibal de Francia. He pretty much summarizes what we are addressing right here. He says, and... Many of you know St. Hannibal. He was the founder of the Rogationist Fathers and the Sisters of Divine Zeal. He had entrusted the Sisters of Divine Zeal and the Rogationist Father with maintaining and even promoting the writings of the Servant of God, Louisa. Now, this was before three of her works, none of her volumes, were sequestered by the Vatican in 1938. And on account of the introduction, now written by Louisa, were placed on the index of prohibited books besides those of Faustina Kowalska, Antonios Rosmini, and others all of which were rehabilitated by the church, the writings of Louisa by Cardinal Ratzinger. And um, St. Hannibal states as follows to a priest who was seeking advice from Hannibal on the writings of another mystic. See, Hannibal was guiding several mystics. He was guiding sister, mother Nazarene, Nazarene from Corrado, the founders of the Sisters of Divine Zeal. He was guiding Melanie Calva from La Salette, he was guiding Louisa Picaret. He was guiding three other mystics at the same time. So this priest, wanting to promote Sister Cecilia Montefiascone's messages, approached Hannibal. He wanted to print them all, the way Sister revealed them. Hannibal said, don't do that. They're mixed with mistakes. You can't just, because she says it comes from God, print them. You have to edit them first. You have to take out what is expressed imperfectly and rework it so it's expressed without changing the message, to rework the syntax so that it's expressed in the proper way. So it doesn't lend to miscommunication. The same thing Hannibal did with Louisa's writings. Mm. He edited them because if you have the original manuscripts of Louisa, you will see not only his cancellations of certain of her words to correct the syntax to avoid miscommunication and misinterpretation, but he, Louisa herself, made changes to her own writings, okay? 
Now here, St. Hannibal's writing, Father Bergameshka, Father, Father Bergamaski, mm -hmm. who had published all the unedited writings of the Benedictine mystic, who was quite popular, named Sister Cecilia of Montefiascone, who lived from 1694 to 1766. Here's what Hannibal wrote, and this is advice for all of us. Conforming, dear Father, to prudence and sacred accuracy, people cannot deal with private revelations as if they were canonical books or decrees of the Holy See. Even the most enlightened persons, especially women, may be greatly mistaken in the visions, revelations, locutions, and inspirations they receive. More than once has the divine operation been restrained by human nature. For example, who could ratify in full all the visions of Catherine Emmerich and St. Bridget, which show evident discrepancies? I love private revelations of holy persons, but I never accept everything. Were I to publish revelations, I would eliminate or revise what is inconsistent with sound criteria, reliable tradition, opinions of sacred learned writers, because I think of behaving prudently. My dear father, to consider any expression of private revelation as dogma or propositions of faith is always imprudent. This is proved by experience, by the mystical theologians, such as Saints John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Castro Tevere, Pauline, etc. We cannot consider their revelations and locutions as words of scripture. Some of them must be omitted and others explained in a right, prudent meaning, unquote. That's a letter from St. Hannibal to Father Bergamaschi. So it seems without a Father Hannibal, without a theologian working with these mystics and this new danger emerges in these end times with this mm -hmm. direct from mystic to internet pipeline that really should be prudently worked out with the proper theological authorities before that type of exposure? Yes, St. Hannibal, St. John of the Cross, both recommend a wise, mature confessor, spiritual director, and um, I would do the same. Earlier we spoke of um, how to avoid deception. Now this is one of the ways to avoid it, by going through the proper ecclesiastical guides like that. Mm -hmm. Another way is to bear in mind the criteria set forth by the church in a document published in 1978, signed by Cardinal Sepper. That enumerates several criteria that a given revelation from an alleged seer must bear in order for them to be considered authentic. So if you wish, I could list some of these criteria. Yes, Father, if you could mention, you know, a few of them for us, that would be fantastic. Okay. All right. Now, as I mentioned, most of these alleged seers have had catechetical instructions. Mm -hmm. They do know the Bible. They do know their teachings of the church. They're not theologians, but they know their Catholic faith. And um, what happens is they bring this knowledge that they've been given from the church to prayer. And then they receive a word of God, but to their own unawares, then they often have to mix it with their own words. And this is where it becomes confusing, like apocryphal literature, as I mentioned before, containing truths and falsehoods together. Now to avoid this, the church has put forth several criteria. The first is immunity from errors in the facts. So no errors in the facts containing this alleged message ought to be present. These errors include, but are not limited to contradictions. So they'll say one thing and they'll contradict it later on. That's another criterion is the content of the message. It has to have sound content, sound doctrine. Now many of today's end time revelations promote teachings incompatible, and I say many, that are incompatible with scripture, tradition, and magisterial teaching, because these speak of a disdain toward the Roman pontiff, hmm. or they um, refuse to acknowledge his charism, uh, supreme universal jurisdiction over the church, and so forth. And they put an emphasis on doom, saving your own skin, hunkering down, uh, end of the world type of things. Now. I'm not bashing people that are mindful of the end times. Let's admit it. We are in the end times. Our Lady has said that. Jesus has said that and approved prophetic literature. 
But our first and foremost concern should not be physical refuges. <laughs> Nowhere in the church's 2,000 years of patristic or hagiographic tradition do you find anything saying, find a safe refuge. This will protect you from physical harm. Nowhere. This is not from God, it's not from scripture, not from tradition, not from magisterial teaching, not from approved prophetic literature. It comes from the human psyche, it comes from the devil, fear. Rather, God says, put your trust in me. Consecrate yourself and your families and your countries to the two hearts, the sacred and immaculate. And if you do that, I will protect you wherever you are. I will even protect, at least in part, the places where you live. Not because you have a physical refuge, but because you're putting your trust in me. So I will be wherever you are. Jesus tells this to Louisa. He says, when you recite the hours of the Passion that bear the imprimatur, any hill upstart, approvals of the magisterium, I will spare that place at least in part because of you reciting the hours of the Passion. Not because you've stored up all this you know, um, artillery to defend yourself. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with defending yourself against an unjust aggressor, that's good. But I'm not saying to, that's not why you do it to save your skin. You'd rather consecrate yourself to the sacred heart. That is why you seek refuge because you're consecrating yourselves. And that's, that's intention of seeking refuge will invariably bring about a protection all around you according to the will of God. Third criterion, I, me I mentioned immunity from errors in the facts, mm -hmm. sound doctrine. The third is sound personal qualities of the subject. If an alleged seer is not mentally balanced well you know they're looking for signs of the lord almost constantly in the sky in images of the clouds which can happen but if they focus on that you know something's not quite right mentally that the mental focus should be on christ intimacy the sacraments the virtues spiritual growth charity works of mercy etc honesty rectitude of moral life habitual sincerity and the ability to resume their normal domestic obligations of life. They don't become detached from their obligations as a wife or a husband, start going to church and leaving their family in the, in the dark. See, God does not violate um, the sacraments he gives us, including the sacrament of matrimony, the sacrament of holy orders. Mm -hmm. So a genuine prophet does not lose their pace, their tempo that they have had with their domestic obligations. Another criterion is mental... Um, balance. I mentioned sound personal qualities. Now this is mental balance. Common sense cautions one to be slow when there seems to be mental or emotional disorders in the seer. Um, psychic disorders, psychopathic tendencies, and these so unfortunately occur sometimes. Another criterion is healthy devotion and spiritual fruits which endure. These include the spirit of prayer, acts of charity, conversions associated with the messages, and so forth. Like we see in Medjugorje, the lines of confessions are running all the time, day in, day in, day out. Pope John Paul II, who is now a saint, called Medjugorje the center of Marian spirituality on the planet. And it is. I got my vocation there. I know of hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, vocations of the priesthood that started in Medjugorje. That's where they happened. Obedience toward ecclesiastical authority, another criterion. Now, ecclesiastical authority is not a heteronomy. It's not a blind internal Ill impulse, as some maintain. The church does not advocate blind obedience. This is found in Gaudium et Spes, Vatican II document, Article 17 through 7 and 79. And then another encyclical written by Pope John Paul II, uh, Veritati Splendor, Articles 41 and 42. So the church does not advocate a blind obedience, but rather obedience here signifies that the seer acknowledges that Christ himself put in charge of his church leaders to guide the flock. This is found in Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 28. Now, obeying legitimate ecclesial authority in matters to which authority extends is required. If a pastor goes beyond his limits of authority, he is not to be obeyed. Mm -hmm. So someone cannot tell you to do something morally and wrong, okay? Another criterion is not seeking monetary gain or fame. Evidence seeking a financial gain closely associated with the messages is a sign of deception. God does not charge for his gifts. They're free. 
you know, but for the labor and for the effort, people give donations and things like that, right? Now, there's also another criteria on the growth in virtue. Every tree is known by its fruit. If the seer is manifestly not growing in the virtues, is irritable, is colicky, snapping at people, angry, that's a sign something's not quite right here, okay? So God endows every prophet with a unique mission. This is important because I've heard of people saying, I'm continuing the mission of Louisa. I'm continuing the mission of Faustina. This is not consistent with church teaching. When I say church teaching, I'm not talking about doctrine, but the teaching of the saints, the teaching of the prophets, that God gives a mission to them, only to them, it's unique to them. And if they don't continue it on earth, Jesus tells this to Louisa Figueroa, they will continue it from above in heaven, but he won't give it to anyone else, okay? And a seer is endowed with a special, unique mission peculiar to that individual only from God and is endowed with therefore special graces to accompany that mission and such graces engender growth in the virtues. And the last criterion put out by this 1978 document from the Vatican is fulfilled prophecies. And this is self-explanatory. It's noted in Deuteronomy that if a prophet makes a prophecy that doesn't come true, it's not a prophecy. So Father, I'd like to... Thank you, Father. I didn't mean to interrupt wherever you were. Oh, no, interrupt away. I'm used to it. <laughs>